Let's quickly review what's been going on for the last week or so in terms of infinite series. Chronologically, I think this is pretty much the way things developed. We talked about certain infinite series, particular geometric and P-series, which you need for some of these tests. Uh, nth term test applies to any series. Integral comparison tests have to be positive term series. And now we're getting back to arbitrary series, like alternating series tests. Uh, these comparison tests, by the way, to make comparisons, you need to know something about P-series and geometric series. Alternating series tests we looked at last time. Roughly, it said that if you had a, a series where the sign alternates back and forth, then it's quite easy to check whether or not that series converges. We'll get back to that. But let's go on to some other things here. Uh, I guess I'll fill that in as we get to it. What I want to do is talk about absolute versus conditional convergence. There are two kinds of convergence. Maybe schematically it would be helpful to look at it this way. If you take a series, it's going to fall into one of three cells. Uh, I probably don't represent things in terms of true proportions. I think an awful lot of series are divergent. If you look at the last quiz, that was the case. Or series are convergent. And up until now, that's all we've been interested in divergent, convergent, black and white, basically. As it turns out, there are two types of convergence, and that's what we want to look at today. There's something that's called absolute convergence and conditional. And absolute is the better. There's a reason for trying to establish whether a series converges absolutely, because if it does, then it has a lot of nice properties. If it converges conditionally, then it's not so good. And uh, I'll mention a couple of reasons why. So from now on, when you come across a series, it's probably going to have some negative signs in it, so it's no longer a positive term series. And you'll say, well, gee, does it diverge? If not, which type of convergence does it have? And in fact, if you're an optimist, I suppose it should go this way. Does it converge absolutely? If not, does it converge conditionally? If not, then it has to diverge. So we'll take a look at some problems and see how this develops. Let me give you what I think is a, r a really good example at this point, because it's a real simple one. We've actually seen the difference between the two. If you take the reciprocals of the integers and throw in alternating signs, that series converges. And the reason is, let me just stick in here without getting too careful, you know, we're alternating plus minus 1 over n. Now, 1 over n decreases to 0. It has to strictly decrease to zero. The signs alternate. Alternating series test then says this thing converges. We did this one last time. OK, so that means we're over here on the left-hand side. The series converges. The question is, does it converge absolutely? And what does that mean? Well, absolute convergence says if you got rid of all the negative signs, If you get rid of all the negative signs, make it a positive term series, does that converge? If so, then it's absolutely convergent. Okay. So is this thing absolutely convergent? Well, that's equivalent to saying, well, is this series convergent? The instantaneous response, good, is that it does not. The second series, the second series diverges. So these two things together say that this thing, given series, 1 minus a half plus a third, the alternating series, 
is conditionally convergent. In other words, it falls up into this region right here. Okay, so let me say it again. Here's the given series. We know it converges by alternating series test. You get rid of all the negative signs. It's a positive series now. That series diverges. The related series diverges. So it converges, but it doesn't converge with absolute value signs thrown in. Therefore, it doesn't fall into this region. It has to fall into this region. It's conditionally convergent. Now let me show you why that's not such a great kind of convergence. I can't show you. I'll just talk to you about it. I mentioned it last time, and we'll see it next week, that this series right up here, the first one, is actually equal to log 2. And the way we'll get that is from the Taylor formula for the logarithm. It turns out that if I shuffle the order in which these terms appear, you know, I might put negative a half up front and then a third, and maybe one back here, and then negative a quarter, a fifth, a sixth, uh, et cetera, and then push something back. In other words, just really kind of jumble things up. <coughs> you may very well change the value of the series. And that's not good. If you take a series and rearrange the order of the terms, it's not nice that you get another number. And if you have a conditionally convergent series, that can happen. In fact, if uh, let's say you go into something like advanced calculus someday, you will find that if you take a conditionally convergent series, you can make it sum to any number you want simply by rearranging the terms. If you want pi out of this thing, it can be done. You want the square root of 2, I can rearrange it to make the square root of 2. I can get this thing to diverge to plus infinity or minus infinity, or I can make it diverge by simply oscillation. As you look at the partial sums, they keep going back and forth and never settle down to anything simply by rearranging the terms. And that's true for any conditionally convergent series. If you rearrange the terms, you may very well change the sum of the series. That turns out not to be the case for absolute convergence. Whatever that means, we'll get into that later. But the reason we want to set off this particular type of convergence is that is, if you take that series, you can do almost anything you want with it in terms of rearranging it and putting parentheses in and stuff, and that will not change the value of the series. You'll always get the same back. So why do we look at absolute convergence? I guess it's because that's a, a nice property to have. Let me give you an example. Uh, if you take this series, which looks like this, 1 minus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared. In other words, I'm taking the squares of the reciprocals, sprinkling in the alternating signs. This thing is absolutely convergent. Okay? That's absolutely convergent because if you get rid of the negative signs, get rid of the negative signs, the associated series is a convergent p-series. In fact, it's p equal 2. So that thing is called absolutely convergent. That original one is absolutely convergent. And what I'm saying here, again, is that I'll send you all out to shuffle up the terms in that series any way you wish. And you all bring them back, and uh, every one of you will have exactly the same sum for the series. You can't change the sum by shuffling terms or rearranging terms. There are other reasons for absolute convergence, but uh, for now, I guess that'll be good enough. Okay, as I said now, your homework problems will start to look like this. Given a series, does it converge absolutely? If not, does it converge conditionally? If not, then it has to diverge. So you're trying to classify it in one of three positions. 
Okay, so let's ask uh, our questions. Is it uh, absolutely convergent? Is it absolutely convergent? Well, let's see. Let's come back here. The series we're looking at starts off 1 over 1 squared plus 4 plus 2, oh, pardon me, negative 2 over 2 squared plus 4 plus 3 over 3 squared plus 4 minus etc. So that's the given series. And what we're to look at is the corresponding series without the negative signs. It would look like this it's the alternating minus plus 1 that gives you the original series. So throwing away the negative signs, you have now a positive term series. Okay, you have a positive term series. Well, that's, that's, well, I don't know about you, but it's good for me because I happen to know some things about positive term series. We have a little arsenal of tests here that we can apply to it. So as a positive term series, does this thing converge? Okay. Does it converge? Any response? No, why not? Nth term test? I'm going to divide numerator and denominator by n squared. And uh, guess what? Nth term goes to zero. Here comes the flying so what? Nth term goes to zero doesn't convince me of anything. So scratch the nth term test. Oh, that's gone. Integral test? Comparison test? We're running out of things. Give it a shot. Okay, comparison test. To run a comparison test, you need to compare it with something. That's why you need to know something about some other series as well. To be able to compare it effectively, you've got to say to yourself, well, if you're going to compare it, it's got to look like something. What does this thing look like as the nth term? A n, when n is large, what does that look like? When it is large, what kind of a, an expression are you looking at? Does the 4 count for much? Not really. At that point, you could uh, effectively hide the stuff that doesn't count for much. What are you looking at now? 1 over n. Okay, let's try comparison test. Uh, if you throw away the stuff in the denominator, you get something bigger, right? How about that, huh? It's your turn to say it. Because I threw away, I made the denominator smaller. <coughs> yeah. No. If I throw away, if I make the denominator um, smaller, your fraction gets bigger. Okay, so we got that clarified. I still am expecting a two-word phrase. So what? The flying so what? Because you've got a bigger series which diverges. I didn't tell you anything about your smaller series. It could still converge. You haven't convinced me of anything. Okay. So that, that comparison we just tried won't work. Scratch comparison test, at least the basic one. 
we have actually now just, from what you've chosen, run out of things except for the limit comparison test. Now, I stand here, I say, well, yeah, so what? But I still think this looks like 1 over n. This little piece over here is what's hanging me up. But if you use the limit comparison test, that's not a hang-up anymore. In this case, what we're supposed to do is take your given and divide by something that you know, or vice versa. In this case, take the given, uh, n over n squared plus 4, and divide that by 1 over n. I think that's really what it looks like. I'm going to skip one step because we've done something like it here not so long ago. Simplifying and kind of unsimplifying, this turns out to be 1 over 1 plus 4 over n squared. That's just a big algebraic step, but uh, let's not get caught up in those little details. As n goes to infinity, what's that go to? Obviously, 1. Now, don't get totally confused. This is not the nth term test. This is not uh, a proof of divergence for that reason. This is the limit comparison test. It says that because this limit in your book, it's called k, I believe, is positive, then this series has the same convergence property as this series, as positive series. Now, what about this one? Sigma 1 over n. What about that one? I forgot Mr. Hamill. He gave me the right answer last time. Sigma 1 over n. Now, sigma 1 over n. Yeah, the terms go to 0, but the series is plus infinity. You're still getting the two ideas confused. There's a sequence of numbers that you're adding up, and they may go to 0, but the series itself, in this case, uh, in fact, is plus infinity. So, this has the same property as this, the harmonic series. Therefore, my given series diverges. Diverges by limit comparison test. And in this case, using the harmonic series as the comparison. Okay, well, it's been a few minutes since I started this problem. What happened? Uh, let's come back here. This was the series I was given. I threw away the negative signs, and I found that I had a divergent series. So this thing is not absolutely convergent. Absolute convergence means that this series converges, and it does not. Again, if you throw away the negative signs and the series diverges, then it is not absolutely <coughs> convergent. Okay, well, let's try again. Let's try the next cell. How about conditional convergence? Okay. Let's take a look at that. Uh, here's our given series again. That picture looks like this. Here's divergence. Here's absolute convergence. Here was conditional convergence. We have just established that it's not here. Throw away the negative signs. It's not convergent. We're wondering whether it's in here or in divergence. Okay. Well, the thing that's going to mess up people, I think, is the following. What's on the left side is basically just plain convergence. So at this point, this is something of a redundant word. If it converges, at least by this picture, it would have to be conditional convergence. We've ruled out absolute. So the question is, is this series that we're looking at actually just plain convergent? You guys are having a tough time here in Army Week, so I better carry the ball at this point. So we're looking at the given series, and we're saying, is that thing convergent? 
the tip off here, sorry to mix my sports, is that this series alternates in sign. And that's the key. If you've got a series which has negative signs in it, about the only test you have is the alternating series test. That's about the only thing you have for a positive response. Now, if the nth term didn't go to zero, but we just saw that it did, then of course you could use this, but that's ruled out. It is not a positive series. You can't use these. Right now, this is the only thing you've got to work with. Does this series converge by the alternating series test? Well, it alternates in sign. That's a given. AN is what you get when you throw away the negative signs again. That is supposed to decrease to zero. Now, we've already shown that it goes to zero. In fact, you know, as we've just said, it looks like 1 over n anyway. So it goes to zero. It's easy to check. The critical thing is that it decreases to zero. It's possible to have a series which diverges, has alternating terms, and the terms go to zero. If it doesn't decrease to zero, then there's no real convergence necessary. So you have to show it decreases. Okay, to show that, what I need to show is that a sub n is greater than a sub n plus 1. This is a critical little point that I think a lot of people skip over, unfortunately. And not only do they skip over it, if they remember to do it, you often get it done wrong. When I say a n plus 1, I don't mean you just put in, in a 1 in the numerator and denominator. You put in a 1 in or, or an n plus 1 in wherever you saw n. Say, no fair just to putting a 1 here and there. You replace everywhere n occurs in a n, you replace the n with an n plus 1. Okay, the, at this point, it's algebra. It was a question. Let me say it is true. Straightforward algebra. Cross multiply, you'll find that it is true. So it alternates in sign. The terms do decrease to zero, strictly decrease to zero. So this thing converges by the alternating series test. And so we've shown that it converges, but not absolutely. Therefore, yep, it is conditionally convergent. It lands right into that block right there. It's not absolutely convergent, but it is convergent, so it has to be conditionally convergent. Now, I've been playing with these words, and I think I've, uh, well, I shouldn't say probably today, possibly convinced you that absolute convergence is a property within itself. And what that means is I've sneaked something over on you. So let me go through the, what I should have done earlier, but I was just trying to get you warmed up to the subject. A given series, A n, is absolutely convergent if the series with absolute values tossed in, in other words, we get rid of the negative signs, converges. That's literally uh, what I've been saying so far. And if you were a lawyer, you would notice a, a big, uh, let's say, gap in my reasoning or, or something. What I'm saying is if, if I hand you a series and you take it and throw away the negative signs, which is like cheating, it seems like, and you find that that is convergent, then we're calling the original series absolutely convergent. I mean, that doesn't make sense. If you modify the series and say, well, yeah, that's, that's convergent now, what's that got to do with the original series? And that's really what the definition says. Given a series, it is absolutely convergent if this modified series converges. So the definition, unfortunately, really presupposes the next theorem, which I'll write down. 
And it's a rather long theorem, perhaps surprising, but at this point it should not be, I guess. If this series converges, that is, if the modified series converges, then the original series also converges. Okay, that's the theorem which, in fact, if I were doing this by the book today, that's the first thing I would have put on the board today. If you take a series and throw away the negative signs in effect, and that converges, then the series you started with also converges. At this point, you would write this in. So I could make a B. That series is said to converge absolutely. Not only just plain convergence, but absolute because the modified series converges. Okay, let's try another example. Now that we're getting a little bit warmed up to the idea, let's take a series that looks like this. Let's start at 0, make that to the end, 1 over n factorial. Okay, let's start off with a, maybe an easier question. Does it just plain converge? Can you at least assure me that it falls over somewhere in this yellow region here? One or the other. Does it converge? Period. More than just observation. Does it converge? That's an easy question, it turns out. Got a couple of yeses. Why? <laughs> Alternating series test. That's all there is to it. It's obvious that the nth term, the nth term without the negative signs goes down to zero. That's trivial. And that's it. Alternating signs. Very obvious, 1 over n factorial decreases to 0. That's it. Ah, but that's not the end <coughs> of the problem. Most of your problems say, does it converge? Absolutely. In other words, if I get rid of my alternating signs, does that positive term series converge? If it does, then we know that it falls into the absolute convergence region. If it doesn't, then by what we've done here, we know it's conditionally convergent. So it's now like splitting a, a hair, you know, one side or the other. Any ideas on that one? 1 over n factorial. Positive term series. Uh, does the nth term go to 0? Yeah, we already established that, so forget that. Integral test. Can you integrate 1 over x factorial? You probably don't even know what x factorial is. What's 0.5 factorial? No. It's on a Hewlett Packard calculator, actually, but uh, that's beside the point. Skip the, <laughs> skip the comparison test. Does it look like anything? Okay, when n gets large, it looks like 1 over n. How do you mean looks like? No, no, you can't drop terms out just because they're getting small. I mean, well, let's, let's do this one. You're saying, well, when you get way out in this series, the terms are small, so they drop out. Right, but that's because the 4 is fixed. The, the statement is that series right there diverges because the 4 is insignificant. 
I don't think that's the case here. Uh, you know, I'm not sure what you're looking at, but this is 1 over n times n minus 1 factorial. Okay, so there's the 1 over n maybe, but that n minus 1 factorial can be a gigantic number. I mean, that's, that could be super big. So I, I don't see the comparison that you're thinking about, I think. If you think it looks like 1 over n, we can try a limit comparison test. Limit as n goes to infinity of uh, 1 over n factorial divided by 1 over n. You know, if you think it looks like 1 over n, try that. If you flip it over, it's 1 over n minus 1 factorial, and that goes to 0, which is not a positive constant. So the limit comparison test does not apply. It still may be divergent for your very reason, but not by the limit comparison test as we see it now. So this is kind of scratch work here. I'm going to erase it because it doesn't seem to be producing much. Well, this is one time that I really didn't expect a response. We haven't looked at series that have factorials in it much. We've seen a lot of powers, but not merely factorials. So what I have to do is produce really the next thing I want on my, on my list here. It's something called the ratio test. And it goes like this. Let's say you're given a series A sub n. Assume a limit exists. Okay, here's where the, the name ratio comes from. Assume that thing exists, then the given series, part A, converges if L is strictly less than 1. Okay, I think that's the way it goes. It diverges if L is strictly greater than 1. It's even better than that. It converges absolutely up in this case. That's another positive. The big negative, though, is you don't know what happens if L equals 1 big question mark. Let me point out the biggest mistake I recall, and that is that you must take the limit. You cannot just take the ratio and say, well, all the ratios are less than 1, therefore the series converges. You must take the limit, and that limit must be strictly less than 1. Okay. Now, I claim that this ratio test is a, a perfect tool for these kinds of problems. Again, I'll give you a little bit of uh, insight to the section. If you've got factorials or if you have powers, very often the ratio test is going to be the thing to use. Okay, so let's see how it goes. Now, I'm starting it looks like I'm starting with the original series, which is what you're supposed to do. I take my original series, take the nth term, and divide it into the next term, right to the right of it. And then I take absolute values, which gets rid of all the negative signs. So even though it looks like I'm starting with the original series, the effect is, of course, in getting rid of the negative terms, I'm looking at this, this uh, derived series right here. The effect is the same. Okay, now be very careful. The n plus first, well, let's do the denominator. The nth term is 1 over n factorial. I mean, that's staring you in the face. Again, this is one of those situations where a lot of people make mistakes. You have to replace n throughout. Not much to say here, though. But you must replace n everywhere it occurs by n plus 1 to get the next term in the series. Now, if you adjust that fraction, I think you'll find that that is 1 over n plus 1, and that converges to 0. Of course, this is where your head starts spinning. Well, if something goes to zero, doesn't that mean so what? Well, that's the nth term test. 
The ratio test says if the limit exists and is strictly less than 1, well, sure is, then the series converges absolutely, in fact. So by the ratio test, this converging to something less than 1 implies given series is absolutely convergent. So the answer is this is one of those good series It's one of the best convergences, the better one, I guess, and that's absolute convergence. Okay. So ratio test is a nice test to look at absolute convergence, or sometimes it's very easy to show that you have divergence here. Only got a couple of minutes to kill. Let me kill only one of them, and that is... This may or may not look somewhat uh, familiar. You just got back some computer programs for the exponential function. And if we recall, that exponential function started out with its Taylor polynomial as 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 factorial, et cetera, until you got down to x to the n over n factorial. And then you had a remainder. Okay, and that was basically it. We stopped at that point. What we're going to see next week is that for any given x, fix x, the remainder goes to 0. That's pretty easy to show, actually. That means that if this goes to 0, the infinite series x to the n over n factorial converges to e to the x because you can look at this as being an nth partial sum. As n goes to infinity, that goes to 0, so this has to go to e to the x. That's the only thing that's left. So e to the x is this series right here. What if you put in an x equals minus 1? You get minus 1 to the n over n factorial. Well, that's exactly what we were looking at up here. So not only does this converge absolutely, but if for some reason you needed the reciprocal of e, that in fact will give it to you. And more generally, if you're building a computer that wants to uh, compute exponential functions, if it keeps going along this series, ultimately it will be as accurate as you wish in approximating e to the x. So we're going to come back full circle, pick up that stuff on Taylor formula, and see what we can do with it. We'll see you next week, I hope.